Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to continue watching the Demi Lovato documentary on YouTube. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's watch. I wish I could say the last night that I ever touched heroin was the night of my overdose, but it wasn't. Okay, so it sounds like she used heroin after the overdose that is referenced in this documentary. And it's shocking to her sister right now. And that happens sometimes. It's hard to believe that someone would almost die and go to the hospital and have their blood coming out of, you know, at a tube in their neck and being, you know, and their organs shut down and strokes and all these problems. And then you go back not only to substances in general, I mean, alcohol, whatever, but you also go back to heroin again. I mean, that sounds utterly impossible. How could someone do that? It happens. Like I've been saying in previous videos, when, you know, the compulsion, the thing that people don't, I think, understand sometimes is that it's not like a choice, like saying, boy, I really love going to Chicago for Oktoberfest. I don't even, does Chicago have Oktoberfest, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, let's see, another example, New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Boy, do I love, you know, I've, I've always wanted to go. I've never been to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. You go to New Orleans, you go to Mardi Gras, and you're like, yeah, you know, not for me. And you, you have a disastrous time, and you come home, and you tell your friends, like, I'm never going back to uh, Mardi Gras. It's terrible. I don't like all the beads. Like, I'm just making stuff up anyway. I've actually been to Mardi Gras. It's actually uh, quite multifaceted and interesting. <laughs> um, but anyway, point is, is that it's not a decision like that where you just say, okay, I've learned from my experience. I'm not going to do it again. The compulsion is real. The compulsion is strong. The compulsion is a, an itch that slowly builds. You know, imagine having an itch in the middle of your back and you can't reach it. Or you have a cast on and you can't reach the itch. It's all you can think about. You can't think about anything else. And you'll say to your, you know, let's, let's just use the analogy of having a cast on your leg and you have an itch on your knee. Now, how many of you right now have an itch on your leg that you're itching? <laughs> just the mention of that caused me to have an itch on my leg. Anyway, now imagine that the itch is building and the itch is building and the itch is building and, and y you know that you could itch it if you just took off the cast somehow, like maybe there's some strap or something that you release it. But the doctor told you, if you take out the cast, if you take off the cast, terrible things could happen to your leg. It might set you back, it might re-injure the legs. But you can imagine, I think most of us can imagine that if you can't sleep at night, if you can't talk to other people, you know, the itch maybe comes and goes, but it builds every day. It just gets worse and worse. And that idea of just take off the cast, it, it, just take off the cast, it's too important. That's what the compulsion, that's what any compulsion is like, let alone the compulsion for using substances. It builds and it builds and it builds. And unless you have, and unless you have a robust system of recovery, then it will become overwhelming. Now, even if you have a ro robust system of recovery, the itch can still be overwhelming as a compulsion. So I hope that you can appreciate, given the analogy I gave, that the compulsion to use, it's not a choice like, well, I think I'll go to, you know, I think I'll go to Mardi Gras again this year. And your friends are like, remember your, the terrible time you had? And you're like, yeah, well, I still want to go. It's not a choice like that. Or another choice might be you have, actually, <laughs> this is apt. So when I was in Mardi Gras last year, I had a po' boy sandwich and I had an allergic reaction. I've never had an allergic reaction in my life. I don't know if it was the crawfish. I, I've eaten um, lots of crawfish in my life, lots of shellfish throughout my life. I've never had an allergic reaction. So I don't know what it was, but I think it was the, the crayfish, crawfish, crawdad, depending on the word you use. And I had an allergic reaction. I... I do not want to have that sandwich again because I don't want to have, and I don't want to have any shellfish for fear of that happening again because I don't want that reaction to happen again. That's a choice that I make in my mind. It's not hard for me to make. It's kind of a bummer because I do like a lot of shellfish, but it's not a huge loss in my life. That is a conscious choice of just like, oh, that's a bad thing. I'm not going to do it anymore. That is a completely different process in the brain and the body and the mind 
than the compulsion to use substances. It's not like that kind of choice. It is a need that you have, like an itch. You almost know it's a bad thing, but you can't help it. You're going to take that cast off to itch because you can't. You just want to exist for a second without having to think about that itch. And if you re-injure your leg, then fine. And I'm guessing that's what happened to Demi. She's just like, the itch was building, the itch was building, the itch was building. And she said she had all the thoughts in her mind that managed to keep her sober for a while. Like, okay, don't do it, don't do it. Remember what happened, remember what happened, remember what happened. But then eventually it got overwhelming. Maybe something happened. That's usually what happens is like there will be some excuse. Like be, someone will go through a bad breakup or someone will be fired from their job or someone will be mean to you or something. And you just think, okay, you know, I, now I deserve it. There's another thing. I deserve to use because of what I'm going through. It's all part of the deprogramming that you have to go through in order to become fully recovered or at least – recover to the point where you don't need a constant system in place to keep you sober. But anyway, let's continue watching. I had just done a week-long um, intensive trauma retreat. The night that I came back from that retreat, I called him. I wanted to rewrite his choice of violating me. I wanted it now to be my choice. And he also had something that I wanted, which were drugs. So she's mentioning a few things. She had a, a week-long intensive trauma recovery experience of some kind. Uh, I'd want to know personally if I was involved in this case, which of course I'm not, but I'd want to know what that trauma recovery involved and what the aftercare was for that. When you go through trauma recovery and therapy or some other activity, there can be a lot of effects. It's, it's good work to do when it's done well and it's done under very particular circumstances. But I don't know. I, I know a lot of people who go through quote-unquote trauma recovery or trauma therapy and it actually is going way too fast for them. And the fact that she used directly after getting out of that sort of treatment is a yellow flag for the possibility that it was going way too fast, meaning that it w there was too much exposure to the trauma, such that there were spikes in distress, such that she needed the substance to cope with it afterwards, or something along those lines. Again, I'm, this is total speculation. I don't know. The other aspect of this is, is that She's talking about how she's trying to get mastery over her abuser. So she is saying that this man abused her, uh, sexually assaulted her, and left her for dead. And she also had, she saw a parallel with her father abandoning her and mistreating her. And she emerges from this trauma recovery and she feels like she wants to get mastery. And this is something that people will do. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to get mastery from trauma. And by the way, if you've been traumatized, find a trauma specialist that really knows what they're doing, that knows how to pace your recovery, and you can recover from the PTSD or complex PTSD or, you know, dissociation, all sorts of issues anyway. But so make sure you find a specialist in that. But a lot of people will try to seek mastery, but there's a lot of different ways that people will do it. Some are functional or some are, some are dysfunctional. One of the dysfunctional ways that people will try to seek mastery over trauma is to recreate it. The hope is, is that this time I'm going to have the power or I'm going to have the ability to control it or I'm going to be able to say what I always wanted to say or maybe even just I caused this to happen, you know, to, to say like – Someone who went through sexual assault trauma, let's say they actually put themselves in harm's way to be sexually assaulted again. You might look at that and say, why would you do that? That's, why would you recreate that? Why, why would that be the method of you trying to be, gain, gain mastery over the powerlessness of the situation? You're just putting yourself in another powerless traumatic situation, and that is true. But to the subconscious mind, there's this confusion that, well, if, I, if I'm the one recreating it, then I am the one that started it, and I am the one in control. Now, that is not the ultimate gestalt of the experience. The person usually walks out of a situation like that going, no, that still felt terrible to me. But it was an experiment that the person is trying to do as a way of gaining power over the situation. And some people will do this repeatedly 
for many, many years, maybe even the rest of their life if they don't get the help that they need. They're always trying to recreate the situation so that it will go different, but it ends up going exactly the same. And this isn't just for assault trauma. It can be with abandonment. We might be abandoned and traumatized in that way as young people, and then we will seek out people who will abandon us. Again, subconsciously, we're trying to recreate it so we can gain some mastery over it, but it just re-traumatizes, I guess, again, and makes us feel abandoned. We might find someone that is abusive verbally to us the way that our parents were when we were growing up, and we're, we're, we're the one in control. We're the one that sought that person out, and this time it's going to be different. It, it isn't different. We end up being re-traumatized. I don't know if that's what Demi is going through, but let's continue watching. I thought, how did I pick up the same drugs that put me in the hospital, I was like mortified at my decisions. Anytime that it's this like, how could you do this? It's coming from a place of, oh, I want this person to be okay. How could you do this again? How could you put yourself in this position? As opposed to, oh my gosh, you must have been in so much pain to put yourself in that position again. Yeah, very wise, very wise statement. Instead of, so he's, painting it in a good light, but sometimes people will be very mean about it. How could you do this? You're so stupid. There's something wrong with you is another reaction that people have outside of this. And the nicer way of saying it is, how could you do this? I'm so worried. But this fella is pointing out a more wise and accurate point of view of, of oh, you must have been in so much pain. And it, yeah, it's a really good point. This is something that I've been talking about is that people's addictions, people's compulsions along these lines relapses are almost always coming from a place of pain. And for some people who are in recovery and relapsing or even full-blown use, they might not even know they're suffering because the suffering is so significant and they didn't have enough people to help them with their emotions when they were growing up such that they don't even really know that they're suffering. You know, I've, I've treated people with uh, compulsion, compulsive uh, substance use problems, and in the beginning, we'll be going down these roads of just like, okay, well, what was your emotional state the day that you, were, that you relapsed? What was going on? They'll be like, ah, you know, it just felt normal. But through emotional regulation, emotional awareness, trauma recovery, a lot of me attuning to their feelings, reflecting their feelings, mirroring their feelings, helping them to understand their emotions, over time, they learn, oh, actually... When I was relapsing, yes, I was suffering, but I, I didn't know I was suffering. And I would just make up excuses, anything to use, because I was, I was suffering so much I didn't know what to do with those feelings. I felt angry at myself. I felt angry at the world. I felt sad. I felt rejected. I felt completely disconnected. But I didn't know that at the time, one, because I wasn't aware of my emotions, but two, because I almost always felt that way. So that was my normal. So he's bringing up a good point. I called him back and I said, no, I'm going to f*** you. And it didn't fix anything. It didn't take anything away. It just made me feel worse. But that, for some reason, was my way of taking the power back. Right. She's talking about it in exactly what I was saying, that... She was trying to get the power back, and she was like, no, this time I'm going to do it to you. You're not going to do it to me, but it ended up just hurting again. Now, on some level, some of these, you know, I've been talking about the messy, bumpy road of recovery. No path of recovery that I've ever seen, you know, is devoid of these kinds of things. It's a messy, bumpy road, and... Uh, and not to say that it excuses it or we should expect it, but one should not be ashamed of it. And good for Demi for just airing this. I mean, it gives me chills just thinking about the fact that she has the bravery to put this out there. Think about all the other people who have a platform along these lines, and they don't talk about this at all because they're ashamed or they don't want to be identified as that or whatever. So it's, you know, good on Demi for doing that. All right, well, that does it for that episode in which we watched the Demi Lovato documentary. Tune in next time when we continue watching. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.